All right, up next is Barry Sanders. I'm gonna see if I can get through these big words, Barry. Barry is a quantum physicist with the Institute for Quantum Science and Technology at the University of Calgary. They are a multidisciplinary group of researchers from the areas of computer science, mathematics, chemistry, and physics. Please welcome Barry. My name is Barry Sanders, that's right, I'm a quantum physicist, and I travel the world to educate people, to collaborate, and to bring scientists together. So I'll tell you what leads me as a quantum physicist to be a, a global traveler. But first I'm going to take one minute, that's three slides, to teach you everything you need to know about quantum physics. Here um, is a famous picture by Douglas Hofstadter, who tries to get the essence across. You can see that it's a blend of the words particle and wave gets the idea across that that's what quantum mechanics is about. By the way, the father of Doug Douglas Hochstetter is the inspiration for the name Leonard Hochstetter, the big bank theory for the fans out there. This uh, slide conveys one of the great mysteries of quantum mechanics. You can see Schrodinger's conundrum here. Uh, he considers a cat put in a box. Box is gonna be, the cat could be poisoned if a radioactive decay sets it off. Not poisoned as it isn't. Quantum mechanics tells us that a radioactive decay time is indeterminate, so the cat's state of life and death itself is not even determined. And that mystery has been a philosophical puzzle for many years, but nowadays we actually make use of it. And in this slide you can see uh, the idea of quantum cryptography. So we can now conceive of building quantum computers that would render all forms of, of quantum encryption, uh, current encryption insecure, um, but we have ways of bringing security back. And this problem has global appeal. You can see in this slide my four affiliations with the University of Calgary, an institute in Toronto, the American Physical Society in New York, and also I work at the University of Science and Technology in China. This is the inauguration event for me and Matthias Weidemuller from Heidelberg, where we've taken on roles in China to collaborate with people there and help China develop its quantum technology. And it's all very exciting. I, I feel very privileged to be able to spend time in China, work with people, and watch the country transform. This is a little picture of my life in China, so you can get an idea of how it works. There's the inauguration again. You can see me at the at Shandong University in Jinan City, province of Shandong, visiting a group and helping some students there. Um, and uh, in the lower left is my uh, office, me sitting at my desk, my office rather plain. So what takes me to being a global quantum physicist is really the inspiration I get from people like Albert Einstein. This is back in 1920. Einstein returned to Germany in 1919 after the First World War. At the time, German scientists were all being ostracized. Einstein was Jewish and the Germans didn't like Jewish people at the time, but Einstein still made sure that everything was global, resisted every effort to ostracize scientists, seeing uh, scientists and quantum scientists as a broad community. This is a picture from Bill Phillips' 1997 Nobel Lecture, where he talks about the great influence he got um, through a Cold War meeting that uh, um, brought together Russian and American and other physicists together in neutral Finland. Here you can see, I took this off Facebook, TripAdvisor, I plugged in a lot of the places I've been. Um, there's a huge concentration of places I go where science is very strong, but you can see points particularly in Africa and Asia and, um, and so the idea is to try to make sure that quantum physics is global. This is typically this is kind of typical of, of the kinds of things that we do. We have classroom events where we talk to people, like I'm talking to you right now, but we also sit on park benches in Prague, or we uh, manually push ferries across a Volga tributary in Russia, um, and that brings us together. But my goal is to try to help scientists get together in countries that tend to be ignored or science is underdeveloped. And you can see the Morocco picture. We ran a meeting last year. We <coughs> co-founded a series called Quantum Africa. That's Quantum Africa 3. Uh, we had a meeting there, and I go to other African countries. We bring people together. Um, I do go to a lot of controversial places, uh, so I really take seriously the idea that scientists are a community irrespective of politics, religion, or culture. And you can see some of the Asian countries I go to, in particular Pakistan, which I visit regularly, and Iran, and also India. Um, the meetings in Iran, I organize meetings in Iran, they tend to be uh, 
So we've heard a little bit about um, you know the without, without borders concept and helping people. Science is a bit tricky. It's both powerful and pleasurable. And so it comes under a lot of political constraint. You can see lower down is a presidential document. It's signed by Bill Clinton that restricts any sort of involvement with Iran, even paying a conference fee. On the other hand, it's not so black and white. This postage stamp from Iran advertises the successful 2000 event, Physics Olympiad, which Americans participated in, took home five medals. So the sanctions are somewhat elastic. It depends on what the purpose is. About a year after that, I wrote an article in Physics Today. It's a, the most popular general magazine for physicists with a concept of science without borders, discussed the Iran meeting and the importance of having scientific collaboration and cooperation not connected at all with, with political events, keeping everything low key. Needless to say, the concept is controversial and I expected that. A few months later, the responses came in um, extremely negative, you know, so there were a lot of people who hate the idea of science without borders, and I perfectly get it. There's a lot of politics involved in science, and there are two sides, and in a sense, both sides are right. But the idea of doing science in Iran became very controversial. And I've carried this message further with full respect to both sides on the issue. This is a talk I gave at the New Hampshire Institute of Politics, talking about the Islamic Revolution, the effect on science in Iran, and the question of how much to engage science in a country where scientific capability can be thought of as a, as a threat. Um, but the concept here is a science without borders. You can see in this picture, we have doctors without borders, teachers without borders, engineers without borders. There's even a science without borders, but that's a different concept of bringing scientific development to countries, whereas I'm much more interested in working with the scientists themselves. And finally, I'd just like to finish that any um, effort to globalize science and globalize the outreach, of course, has to begin at home. So after every trip, everything I do, I love to return home. You can see uh, members of my institute and the advisory board were off on the verge of shale, enjoying it. it's a warm July day, and uh, also um, the Telespark Science Cafe outreach adventure. Thanks.